Whoa, that's a... Uh... Where would you even stab something like that? I'm not too proud to admit when I'm scared. Terrified, actually. Oh, sure, that. Whatever that be, why not? So alone. Never alone. As Kaizo preached. We are the gates of Akaizo. We guard the silence of Akaizo. You are a disturbance. Once, but no longer. The old ones forged the cornerstone of Okaizo, but outsiders built around it. Aethas has disturbed the bones of Okaizo. The old pacts permit him to pass, but you will go no further. Okaizo is closed. The gates are barred. Our covenant with the Old Ones does not forbid questions. The living were meant to forget Ukaizo. Nothing can be gained of remembering it. We will indulge ourselves before shredding your name from the long scroll of existence. The chosen people of the Dead Fire called Ukaizo home. The outsiders were their contemporaries. Full of wisdom, ingenuity, and terrifying ambition. That sure sounds like the Ingwithans. Guess they got around. The outsiders passed from the world. None of them remain. Not all of them passed. But we got the one they left behind. The old ones and the outsiders traded, collaborated, learned, and built together. Outsiders augured the doom of the old ones. The rift unmade them both. The outsiders coveted ancient Ukaizo. Its occupation was a hindrance. Machines were built on a foundation of outsider lies. When the machines were nearly done, the outsiders constructed bodies of flesh and bone. Skeletons, now. Their remains littering great Ukaizo. Ones which drew the spirits of the dead through a sieve. Finally, the outsiders fashioned a guardian to stand vigil over their work. Our bond with the old ones compelled us to trust their allies. They offered us a trade, eternal life for eternal service. We were ordered to slam shut the gates of Okaizo for all time. The outsiders vanished from the world, leaving the old ones dumbfounded. Quiet gave way to chaos. Storms battered the seas. The sleeping hearts of mountains awoke with fury. When the last screams of the old ones faded, only we remained. None but the green colossus whose every footstep disturbs tranquility. You are the first kith to visit the shores of Las Ukaizo, and you will be the last. This idle chatter was a refreshing change of pace. May your journey through the wheel be an informed one. You chose death when you set your bearing, Traveler. Prepare yourself. You're mine!
about as useful as a bump on a pickle. <laughs> Something stronger. No, Ixi, on us. i 
liberate the chair. <laughs> something I can do? What for? Love no You're a and I stem Not a problem. Hope you got a way of turning off that storm. Look, I got time. I'm all ears. Tell me what's on your mind. Always. Not a day or night goes by that I don't glimpse the darkness. But that's all right. It calls to me. My duty and my God. It knows I got a wildness in my blood, Watcher. No need to fit your thing, Watcher.
What's on your mind? It doesn't seem powerful. But starting to think we'd be if you like. Uh, I like that. Would, not that I look. Ended up moving to add in some with my folks. That's one. My folk. I don't know if that was something. If you like. Uh, I but when it, it's not, she was so sure of herself. She, it doesn't powerful. If you like. Uh, I like that. No, I look. Ended up moving to add here and track. Consider it done. <laughs> Gilded Vale got its name from the way the wheat fields used to look in the sun. But there might as well be a different world. Well, hard to miss what you can barely remember. These great people got a funny way of passing on. You know, I broke a wheel once too. First thing I thought of when we learned what Aethys was doing. My mom had this spinning wheel, and she loved it. Well, I was playing with it in the way a young child might when his parents are out, and... That wheel came right off. It wouldn't go back into place, so I pushed it harder and harder, and pretty soon I'd broken off a spoke. Broke off three more trying to fix that. Anyway, I got whipped pretty good for it. That wheel was never the same, even after my dad fixed it. I used to think of the gods as being like parents to all of us. But now I know better. They're children, playing while their folks are gone. We gonna do this, or what? If it's all the same to you, Watcher, I'd rather not miss the moment my god brings the darkness down upon us. I want to see Gon become the true deity of death. How could it not? Gon is the aspect of death and decay. The other side of Aethys, who we know governs the process of rebirth. But Aethys died in the Saints' War. And now Gone is going to destroy reincarnation as we know it. Tell me, Watcher, can there be a god of light and birth if souls themselves can no longer be reborn? It was, and I'd do it again, only bloodier this time. Think of all the souls I could have gathered if I'd reaped them right from the living. Sure, you can trust me at your back, even if you're going against my god. I thought it'd be different how it turned out, but I couldn't dream of any other way. Now then, shall we go face my god for one last time? Find out what it is we can or can't do in these end times. Whether we're meant to wither or thrive, consider me your second shadow. I look back, and I ain't but half sure how we got ourselves here, Cap. Working with a Juana. It ain't the course I'd have charted. But that don't mean your compass be broke, neither. I certainly ain't thrilled about shooting up the lads and lasses of the Principe. They ain't perfect by any swabby sorry count. But they be family all the same. Not that I were aiming to sink all them Juana thrice over and twice again. Fucking shame, that. Probably a lesson to be learned there. Couldn't say what, though.
The machine controlling the storm winds down. The clattering of its machinery settles into a low whir and then, at last, hiccups to a halt. Beyond the tower, the black, roiling clouds of Andra's mortar roll away from the ancient city of Ukaizo, with only a tired sigh of wind to see them off. And on that last breath of wind comes to you a familiar sound. The ring of a bell. The bell's ringing is soft, not the clangor and torrent you've grown used to. It calls to your soul, and your soul yearns to follow it. Your soul flees from your body and into the beyond, chasing that sound. It leads you at last to Bareth's realm, to that cold platform and room of endless doors. Watcher, your journey nears its conclusion. The pallid knight stands before you, her gaunt face impassive. Free of your duty to me, perhaps. But mine is not the only tie that binds you. You have gathered quite a few since we first spoke. Soon you will confront Aethys for what will likely be the final time. And you will do so as the Herald of Barath, the only creature on the face of Aora to whom he will listen. Remember that. The pallid knight inclines her head to you, black hair hanging lank in her face. She steps back and cedes the floor to Helia with a small, resigned sigh. If Aethys truly intends to go through with his mad plan to destroy the wheel, a generation's worth of souls will be trapped in the in-between. So many would suffer. How can Aethys be so cruel? He cannot just abandon them. Aethys must help the kids find a quick solution. Abaddon... Aethys thrust this crisis on the Kith. They did not bring it upon themselves. Their only mistake was entrusting us to watch over them. Who will help them rebuild their world now? Aethys will reveal every secret of the gods. Will Kith be able to change the established order if they have no wonder to inspire them? Aethys must help them resolve this quickly, lest every one of Aeora's few remaining mysteries be laid plain. Coddled children learn nothing that is not spoon-fed to them. With the wheel destroyed, Kith will tear themselves apart. It is the gods' duty to prevent that happening, lest they doom us all. And as Kith must be ruled, so too must the gods. I say that if Aethys is so eager to throw down the mantle of power and step aside, I shall take my rightful place as Queen of the Gods again. Kith are strongest when they follow our lead, and we are strongest when we lead in turn. United in purpose with the gods, Kith can accomplish things that without us they could never have even begun. They must be shown their boundaries to surpass them. Kith will not solve Aethys' puzzle on their own, and without an established order to fight against, the bonds that bind them dissolve, and they fight amongst themselves. Scan says, and casts a long look toward Wodica. You underestimate your kind, Watcher. Wodica's firm hand is but the motherly smothering of Helia by another name. Mortals should have no special advantages. Only once Kith have striven to improve themselves through trial will they truly know their measure. Kith must suffer to find their strength if they are to survive the world into which Aethas drags them. Gall Our intervention in your struggle would be a cruelty and counter to our purpose. Gallowayne says... He lets his words hang in the air for a moment. Gaze, level with your own. Indeed. Kith must discover for themselves what it is they are worth, and of what it is they are capable. What we do for them, they do not learn for themselves. Trial breeds ingenuity. If our work of generations was not in vain, Kith will succeed in spite of Aethys' actions. I have faith in Kith's ability to meet Aethys' challenge. 
Do not mistake my words for indifference, Watcher. They are born from a fierce belief in your potential, not a refutation of it. And yet you come to Hokaizo with only the Huana at your back. All that Kith stand to lose. And even then, your leaders could not join hands, squabbling instead over prestige and resources. You believe that will change when my final death comes calling? You are a greater fool than I thought. Margren is blinded by her affection for mortals. She does not see that entropy is the destiny of all things. If Aethas were wise, he would destroy everything. End life. End reincarnation. End death. Kith have had their chance. It is time to let silence reign. As Rimmergon's words fade, the Pallid Knight returns. She no longer towers over you, a giant even among the gods, but meets you at your height. She lets the arms crossed over her chest fall to her sides. She speaks to you openly, plainly, an expression almost like tenderness, turning up the corners of her lips. Well, Watcher, you know where we stand. What do you believe? The Pallid Knight raises one dark eyebrow. I did not conjure the wheel as you know it now from the air. It was built slowly, with great deliberation by Kith. It is as much your wheel as mine. Now the time has come for us to part, Watcher. I laid upon you a difficult duty. You will be free of it in time, but not now. You have work to do yet. You are no stranger to hard choices. You killed Theos. And when his soul was laid bare before you, you chose to destroy his memories. You freed him from his past. Remember the strength it took to make that choice. And know that you alone may sway Aethys now. When you stand before him, choose your words carefully. She claps her gauntleted hands together, and a sound like thunder rumbles through the room. As the floor crumbles and falls away beneath you, you hear the sound of a single bell ringing, and beneath it, the faintest whisper. You keep falling asleep on me, I'm gonna have to start walking behind you with a pillow. Oh, by the way, uh, the storm's gone. Also, I think Aethys is ending the world. Gods and darnation! My head! Ugh. And here with me thinking we were right and proper dead this time. We ain't dead, right? So now it comes to this, Aimiko. You think to steal my golden dream. But I will not allow it to happen. My gratitude is yours for disabling the storms. It seems I did not require Rivan's ship to reach Ukaizo in the end. Not on your soul. I have waited for this, Casita, for far too long. Until the next life. Nor, perhaps not, considering... Worthy. 
than Roth. You descend into the ancient winding streets of Ukaizo. Battered by storms for thousands of years, the ruins bear the marks of their role as the lone witnesses of the gods' great secret at the center of the city. The houses and boulevards are pierced by great spears of luminous Audra. There are no ashen bodies, no birds, no sign or sound of any life. But with every step, the rhythmic pounding in the distance draws nearer. Soon, you can feel the vibration traveling up your spine. As you approach the center of the city, the weathered architecture gives way to more luminous Audra piercing the ruins, eventually overtaking them entirely. Cresting the top of a fallen tower, you finally get a clear view of Aethys. He stands, legs astride, next to a great stone monument ringed with eleven cavernous alcoves. All but three hold a gargantuan skeleton, bones scrubbed clean by the city's storms. An immense anguithin machine floats above the monument, suspended by invisible energy emanating from a well of light beneath it. Great brass rings spin around a core of metal and Audra at the machine's center. Periodically, Aethys's massive arms swing back. The movement alone is enough to draw great gusts of wind toward him. When they come down on the machine, the impacts are accompanied by eruptions of electricity, fire, and smoke. The hundreds of luminous Audra pillars across Ukaizo sympathetically dim in a rippling wave that spreads out from the machine. The only safe route to the god is a steep ascent along a monstrous pillar of luminous Audra, intertwined with fragments of Ukaizo's ruins that it has carried through the centuries. The pillar bends in a long arc, towering above the machine. The pillar levels out near Aethys's head, a silent observer to the destruction of the machine it has grown beside over thousands of years. You weave your way along a treacherous rain-slicked path up the pillar's skyward side. As you arrive at the top, you catch Aethys's attention. Fist pulled back, he pauses to observe you. With the same gentleness he showed at Ashen Maw, 
He lowers his arm and turns toward you. Strange to see you Kaizo in this way. It may be hard to picture, but this city was once full of life. The Hawana, yes, but also kith from many other cultures. Great hanging trees shadowed these boulevards. Gardens sprawled across the open rooftops. Each spring, a festival procession would wind its way from the hillside into this valley. The celebrants would pass through a steep walk among the stalls of foreign merchants, flowers falling upon them from all sides. All people of all nations, together in a celebration of new life. Such was the power and beauty of Lost Ukaizo. If we don't fix this mess you're about to cause, the whole world is gonna look this bad. I mean, it's a mighty heavy load you're putting on our shoulders. I just hope we can carry it. As long as there are people like you in this world, Adair, I truly do. This power has always been in the grasp of mortals. Now you will finally be aware of it. Now you will be able to decide what to do with it. Ukazo's corpse is beautiful, my god. This, its current state, is but one spoke in the ever-turning wheel of life and death, and so no less worthy than its incarnation at birth. But you seek to break that wheel. I beseech you, Gon, that when you do, you do it right. Burn to ash every Audra root in hell so that it may never regrow. Let the darkness reign eternal. It saddens me that the harvesting of souls in my name has brought you to this place, Shoti. But I am the cause, and I must take responsibility for it. I can only hope that after I am gone, you will see there is a brighter future for mortals. It is a future that you can help shape, even if you cannot see it now. But what of you, Watcher? Why have you followed me? Have you come to bear witness to the breaking of the wheel? It is pity for mortals that drives me, Watcher. I have felt it in every step I have taken to cross the dead fire and reach this place. What more would you have me do? It is true. While the eventual restoration of the wheel will bring them relief, they will suffer until that time comes. Thank you for making me think of the Lost Souls, Watcher. I will provide a haven for them after my work here is finished. I must attend to my final work now. I cannot delay any longer. You have carried a heavy burden across the dead fire, Watcher. Before I go, I would rid you of it. You are free now. As free as any of us can be. Many will come to you for help in the years ahead. Animancers, priests, even the gods themselves. I have great hope for you. But always remember that your future is for you to decide. Use your freedom well. Aethys squares himself to the machine. As you move to a safe distance, he draws his fist back and resumes his assault. The blows rain down with increased fervor, but the machine perseveres in spite of his efforts. Spreading his arms wide, Aethys draws power from the luminous Audra clustered around the valley. The energy courses through his body, limbs overflowing with intense light and waves of heat. He returns to his task, each strike bringing with it the sound of cracking stone and twisting metal, the flickering of luminous Audra across Ukaizo. As the ancient machine finally begins to succumb to his strength, so too does Aethys' body. Built to withstand the passage of thousands of years, the great Audra statue has finally been pushed beyond its limits. Cracks appear along the hands, then race up the arms. Aethys does not slow his assault, but continues unabated. Its brass rings twisted. The machine spins erratically, but withstands the relentless barrage. 
Aethys stands astride it and pummels the base of the machine. Soul energy begins to flare out from the machine's heart, warping the air with the intense heat. Aethys drives his right fist into the machine's center, the core of metal and Audra. The god lets out a deafening shout, something between a cry of anguish and a roar of exultation. You see Aethys' arm shatter upward from his hand through his elbow. A flash of light and heat bursts from the core, accompanied by a cacophony of destruction. The moment passes as Aethys' shout echoes throughout the valley. Your eyes begin to recover. The god's work is accomplished. The great machine of Ukaizo has been destroyed. The wheel has been unmade. As Aethys' voice fades, the enormity of what you've accomplished sinks in. You have confronted a god. You have rediscovered the ancient city where the wheel was forged, and you have seen the wheel shattered. What comes next is uncertain, but already the legend spreads of the Watcher, who survived Andra's mortar and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Aethys. Maras Nua's body finally goes still amidst the rubble of the Anguithin machines, yet it continues to glow. Priests and mystics have strange dreams of an island of eternal dawn at the eye of a storm, a port where the tide never flows out, a roadside tavern whose door leads only inward. As a watcher, you see what these dreamers cannot. The souls of the departed drifting toward the Audra Colossus and the twilight afterlife within. Whether it is a temporary haven or a permanent end will depend on what the kith of Aeora are able to accomplish on their own. The greatest hope seems to lie in the work of the ancient Anguithans and the Huanus efforts to unearth and understand it. And reclaiming Ukaizo is both a symbolic and a practical victory for the Hawana. The ancient city is a potent reminder of their people's ancient glory, and it promises to be a much more easily defensible capital, especially with the storm controls of Andra's spire close at hand. The other tribes unite under the Kahanga and dedicate themselves to rebuilding Ukaizo and relearning its secrets. The Valian Trading Company continues its operations in Deadfire, though it is forced to renegotiate many of its contracts with the newly empowered Juana Crown. Company leadership finds that the new terms are much more favorable to the tribes than to their own interests in the region. Due to these changes, the Valian Trading Company eventually withdraws most of its people from Deadfire. The Royal Deadfire Company is allowed to continue trading in the archipelago, though they are forced to submit most of their outposts and fortifications to Huana leadership. The storms across the Rawatayan mainland subside along with those of Andra's mortar. However, Rawatai regards this respite with a wary eye, ever mindful that the machinery at Andra's spire remains under their foe's control. The battle at Andra's mortar leaves the fleet of the Principi Sen Petrena in shambles. Thus sundered, they fight among each other until they are little more than squabbling bands of pirates. They continue to harass unguarded merchant vessels, but they are fit for little more. Gone are the dreams of empire and the hunger for primacy. Despite other tensions across the archipelago, Port Maje remains a model of peaceful, productive cooperation between the Juana and the Valian Trading Company. Though they do not always agree, Governor Clario and Storm Speaker Ikawa work together for the mutual benefit of their people. As the balance of power changes in Deadfire, so too does Nekataka transform. Though the Kahanga monarchy moves its new seat of government to Ukaizo, Nekataka continues to be a busy and important city. The pirates continue smuggling food into the gullet, and the Raparu embrace their benefactors, aiding and concealing their smuggling operations. Over time, the gullet becomes a hotbed of piracy.
Ukaizo reveals more about the ancient art of water shaping than the guild could have hoped to learn in another century of work. With this new knowledge, water shapers across the archipelago wield the currents and bend the waves for the pleasure and benefit of the new Huana nation. Your brief encounter with Letharn proves deeply influential for the children of the Dawnstars. He comes to recognize his nightmares and the scene at Hisongo as Aethys's final warning to his people. Unite in strength and faith, or perish forever. As word of Aethys's deeds at Ukaizo spreads, his fellow Dawnstars take this message to heart. The children of the Dawnstars respond to Aethys's sacrifice by taking up the lanterns and sickles of the Harvesters of Gaunt. They become pilgrims of essence, gathering souls across Aeora and ferrying them to the haven within the Audra Colossus. Others will repair or rebuild the wheel one day. In the meantime, the Dawn Stars will care for the souls of the dead. With the Audra at Pokokohara destroyed and hopes of a Valian outpost dashed, the tribes resolve to leave Tikawara behind. Small and mobile, they move amongst the Kua Orakuhu Islands where they escape the notice of larger powers. To the misfortune of many, a group of slavers remains entrenched on Crookspur. While they profit off the misery of Kith, no one is able to stop them. Ships continue to disappear at the southeastern fringe of the archipelago, and stories circulate of a colony of vampires and gulls preying on their crews. The queen soon sends a contingent of her bravest warriors who end the horrors of Splintered Reef. Though your adventures alter the destiny of Aeora and the balance of power in Deadfire, they also leave a lasting mark on those who travel at your side. Your companions find themselves changed in ways both big and small. In the days sailing back from Ukaizo, Adair finds himself disillusioned with all gods, his own above all. Where the gods have touched dead fire, he sees only destruction, loss, and emptiness. He casts off all symbols of Aethys, and even begins refusing to use his name. Ultimately, he chooses to remain with you on the Defiant, knowing if any mortal is to have the final word in a conflict with the gods, it will be the Watcher of Cadnua. Shodi is not a priestess who understands the meaning of subtlety. As such, she makes her girlish crush on Adair painfully obvious from the moment she first sets eyes on the strapping fighter. Early in your travels, Adair appears discomforted by her persistent flirting. He often grimaces when she sidles up to him, and he takes endless pains to keep their conversations terse and to the point. But after a little smoothing on your part to nudge them in the right direction, Adair makes an effort to view Shodi with an open mind. And Shodi begins teasing the veteran fighter in a more companionable and less amorous manner. After saving each other's hides a couple times and sharing more than a few laughs, the two form an easy, and you suspect, lifelong friendship. Plagued by constant nightmares and hallucinations, Shodi becomes increasingly disassociated from reality. Meanwhile, her power continues to grow with every soul she harvests. You start to notice sliced-up animal corpses everywhere you two travel. But when confronted about it, Shodi stomps her feet and fiercely denies any wrongdoing. Then, one night, Shodi wakes, but never leaves the nightmare. Shivering uncontrollably, she packs up her belongings and slips away into the darkness, murmuring, that she must return to the Temple of Gaon in order to fulfill her purpose to her god. But she never reaches the temple. None of the Dawn Stars know what's become of her, aside from disturbing rumors of a harvester ravaging the southeastern islands in the dead fire, leaving a trail of blood in her wake. If Aloth has learned one thing from your adventures, it is that the forces shaping the world are vaster and more complex than he had ever imagined. And they are far beyond anyone's power to control. Thus, it is with great relief that he abandons his labors against the Leaden Key. 
Without Theus at the helm, it will crumble in its own time. The best he can do is stand back and allow it to happen. Seraphin seems little impacted by your journey. Always knew the gods were larger than me, he tells you, on the evening he decides to part from your company. He's too long put aside those he cares most for. He confesses over a bottle of rum, and he's got leagues to sail to make it right. The following morning, he's gone, leaving only a crude stick figure rendering of Aethys, scrawled into the hull to mark his passage. For assisting the Watcher with the Juana conquest of Ukaizo, Palagina is immediately dismissed from the Brotherhood. With no friends left among the Valian Trading Company, Palagina is banished from the Republics. Seen as a Valian by the Juana and an outcast by her own people, she finds the dead fire cold and unwelcoming. Spirit broken, she eventually boards a ship bound for Defiance Bay and is not heard from again. Time away from the Navy gives Maya Rua some perspective on how Rawatai conducted the dead fire occupation. No sooner does she return to active duty then she voices her frustrations over some of the more underhanded tactics she witnessed and carried out in the name of the homeland. Her voice carries all the way to the Ranganui, who reminds his admirals that battles are won by superior tactics, but war is a battle of precedent, and winning is not always a victory. The people listen. She looks forward to seeing her brother again. So does Ashiza. The discovery of Ukaizo doesn't bring to Kehu the answers that he sought, but this proves only a minor setback. Merely knowing that Ngati's Chosen landed on the island ignites something in the Juana tribes, a fervent desire to recover the past and let history illuminate the way forward. To Kehu rides this momentum, leading by example and teaching his people to rely on each other instead of on omens. His message is an upheaval of norms, but it's as embraced and beloved as he is. He bids you farewell, suggesting that you seek your next adventure in a brothel or tavern where consequences begin and end at the front door. He sounds eager to leave old conflicts in the past. Your pursuit of Aethys and your journey to Ukaizo signal the end of forces that have shaped the lives of Kith and the course of nations. The cycle of reincarnation has been broken. The storms of Andra's mortar have calmed. Yet each ending promises a new beginning. As the sun rises over Ukaizo, Kith turn their gaze eastward, wondering at what lies beyond, and at the world they will fashion for themselves. As the Watcher of Cadnua and the former Herald of Bereth, you return to your ship and begin the long journey home. You hope for calm weather. <laughs>